I'd like to invite Tom Derrick from the British Library, which is a member of the Reed Co-op, and Nicole Merkel-Hill from the Heidelberg University Library to the stage. Okay. Um, I hope it's okay to say that you are a private member of the Reed Co-op. And uh, we move on with, uh, I think it's a presentation about Index Script. Thank you for the kind introduction and good morning to you all. Tom and I are happy to have the opportunity to present two projects from two institutions with one common goal, and that is text recognition for non-Latin and to be more specific for South Asian scripts. With our two projects, um, we show where the challenges lie in text recognition for this material and what we have achieved with Transcribus so far. Tom is digital curator for the two centuries of Indian print project at the British Library and deals with 19th century printed books in Bangla script and language. But he is also working with printed material in Urdu language written in the Persian Arabic calligraphic script Nastalik. My project, Naval Kishore Press Digital at Heidelberg University Library, also deals with 19th century printed books, but focuses on the Devanagari script, which is used for various um, South Asian languages. So basically, we are dealing with three different scripts, and they have the following features. Bangla and Devanagari are written from left to right and are so-called Abugida scripts. That is a segmental writing system in which consonant vowel sequences are written as units. Each unit is based on a consonant letter and vowel notation is added. The inherent vowel, which is usually a short A, may be changed by adding a vowel mark or diacritic. Both, both scripts make frequent use of ligatures and these can be formed by combining two or more consonants. And the total number of ligatures existing in Bangla and Devanagari amount to several hundred, and this is definitely a challenge for text recognition. The Nastalik script is used within South Asia primarily for the Urdu language. It is um, written from right to left and is one of the main calligraphic script types for Persian and Urdu. As usual with Arabic scripts, vowels are not written, except perhaps as diacritics. And the characters have three different forms depending on the position within the word, initial, middle, or final. So after this short excursion on South Asian writing systems, I turn to the Heidelberg Naval Kishore Press project, which is abbreviated NKP. The Naval Kishore Press was founded in, uh, north, in the North Indian city of Lucknow in 1858 and grew to one of India's most important publishing houses. The press's portfolio covered books in Hindi, Urdu, Persian, Arabic, and Sanskrit on subjects as diverse as religion, education, medicine, school books, Sanskrit literature, as well as translations of English classics. The library of the Center for Asian and Transcultural Studies at Heidelberg University holds with approximately 2,200 titles a representative cross-section of the press's publications. Some books in the collection show paper decay and text loss. The books were printed with lead type, but there are also numerous volumes that were printed using the lithographic method. This was a preferred printing technique in India in the late 19th century because it was inexpensive. There are many bilingual books in the collection. So for example, we have classical Sanskrit texts with Hindi commentaries or texts in Prajpasha, a literary language that was common before the standardization of modern Hindi. And commercial OCR software which does exist, usually does not provide a good recognition for result for bilingual or multilingual text because uh, they usually rely on inbuilt dictionaries. So when we started our project with Transcribus in 2018, the aim was to digitize selected works from the Devanagari section of the collection, provide searchable full texts, 
and make, if possible, ground truth data available for reuse. Our typical workflow with Transcribus includes layout analysis, creation of ground truth, training of HTR plus models for recognition, and last but not least, the application of the models on the text. The Devanagari books in the NKP collection have two typ typical layout variants. A very simple book layout consisting only of page number, header, and text body. And here we either use the Transcribus standard model for the layout analysis or our p 2 pala model trained on 60 pages. The second book format, um, where you see a sample page on my slide, is the so-called POTI format, which is based on Indian manuscripts. For this format, we also trained a model with p 2 pala on the basis of approximately 50 pages, and the model was trained to recognize all text regions, and these are usually chapter numbers, page numbers, header, and text body, and the model also recognizes the baselines. For the ground truth, we used existing transcriptions from an earlier phase of the project, but there was extensive post-correction necessary. And for our transcribus experiments, which I will discuss later, we created the ground truth ourselves. Our generic uh, HTR plus model for Devanagari, which we now use for the NKP collection, as well as other Devanagari texts outside the collection, was trained on the basis of 200 pages and 26,000 words as ground truth. And it is based on five different type fonts, and it achieves on the validation set and impresses two point, a character error rate of only 2.3%. And because of the good recognition results, we have made Devanagari mixed M1A available as a public model on the Transcribus side, and it already has been tested by the community, and we got quite good feedback. So currently, we are experimenting with Transcribus in two directions. On the one hand, we are training HDR plus models for the recognition of texts printed by using the lithographic method. And this is our first attempt with, strictly speaking, handwritten material. Our first model is based on approximately 17,000 words of ground truth and has been trained to recognize the hand of two different writers. This model already achieves a character error rate on the validation set of 9.9%, and we're now creating more ground truth to improve its performance. Since scholars in Indology often work with transliterations, our second experiment is training data models for Devanagari texts based on ground truth transliterations. This means that the original text of the, on the facsimile is written in Devanagari script, but the ground truth used for training is produced in Latin transliteration. And we are lucky here because there is an internationally accepted transliteration scheme for the Devanagari script, the so-called International Alphabet of Sanskrit Transliteration, which is widely used by scholars. So we relied on um, this transliteration scheme for the creation of the ground truth. Here we are collaborating with the Department for the Study of Religion at the University of Toronto, and they provided us with roughly 20 pages of ground truth on the basis of which we trained a first model. It came out with a character error rate of only 4%, and I found that really amazing because I didn't think it would work. So these two experiments have produced good initial results and we will definitely stay tuned and try to improve the performance of our models. So what do our users, scholars in South Asian studies, get out of it? So far we have performed text recognition for around 12,000 pages. These have been exported in Alto XML format and ingested into the Heidelberg University Library's web presentation. 
and uh, scholars can search the text in Devanagari script or Latin transliteration, and a word or phrase found searching the full text will be highlighted in the facsimile and in the OCR text on line level. I tried to visualize this with a screenshot. Um, yeah. And furthermore, users can download a high quality OCR PDF of the facsimile where the text is also fully searchable in Devanagari script and Latin transliteration. That much on Naval Kisho Press Digital, and I now hand over to you, Tom. So, as uh, Nicole mentioned, I'm from the British Library, uh, where I've been working with uh, transcribers to recognize text from um, our South Asian printed books collection. Uh, so these are books in Indic scripts that have been digitized through a project called Two Centuries of Indian Print. And they cover a diverse range of topics and uh, genres, everything from religion, uh, history, translations of Western texts, poetry, drama, etc. And intended for uh, enhancement of the study of book history for South Asian scholars. Uh, so we have digitized a couple of thousand books, which are mostly available through our online catalog. Most of the books are in the Bengali language and script, uh, but also we have books available in Assamese, Saleti, and Urdu. So in terms of the um, features of this collection as it relates to OCR, there are around about 30 different publishers from these books. Um, majority of the books were published mid to late 19th century. And many of these publishers adopted different typographical standards, which has manifested in, to, in the books um, as types that are of different sizes um, and fonts. But mostly, they are not too difficult for OCR. Uh, the majority of the pages are, as you can see, uh, single column blocks of text. So the layout is not enormously uh, difficult. However, there are title pages often with large uh, title font, which is a little more difficult for transcribers to always correctly draw the baseline. There are some, but very few multilingual pages with English and Bengali, but the majority of the books that we have been using have been um, completely written in Bengali script. And the print quality uh, is very good, in fact, um, not much to say on that other than some of the books have faint print and there's some show through uh, on occasion which can affect the OCR output. But um, on the whole, not as problematic a collection as um, Nicole was dealing with at Heidelberg. So to take you through the transcribus workflow that we adopted for um, our printed Bengali books, Actually, before we used Transcribus, we experimented with some other OCR tools. Uh, through a couple of competitions, we evaluated the OCR accuracy of Google Cloud Vision tool and also Tesseract. Um, it's not completely fair to compare the accuracy of those to what we're seeing with Transcribus because we gave them far less training data at the time. And the results from Google were actually pretty good. Uh, but at around the same time, we started using Transcribus and we liked the fact that we could train it specifically on our own material, whereas Google's Cloud Vision was drawing on all the synthetic data that it's working with, which is often much more modern than the historical books that we're working with. Um, so we settled with Transcribus, if you'd be pleased to hear. And yeah, we also could have created models for each of the different typographical um, styles that we were seeing from the publishers, but we adopted a more generalist model where we drew on a sample of um, pages from our collection, uh, which represented the different um, types. And through three different cycles of training um, for 50 pages and then 100, seeing very good improvement on character accuracy, eventually, after 150 pages of ground truth training, we were content um, with the 5.5% character error rate mm -hmm. that we would use um, that model to automate the rest of our Bengali books. And I should also say that the, we're very thankful for the support of Jadavpur University in Kolkata, who uh, produced the ground truth transcriptions for us. 
So uh, the model as well was trained on just over 19,000 tokens. Uh, we verified the accuracy manually as well and found that to be consistent with the results that Transcribus was giving us. Um, so we also discovered with the majority of the books the layout analysis was very good. Uh, baseline detection was excellent, but for about 200 books it was not. It was drawing multiple baselines. We ended up training a P2 PALA model on just baselines and that's vastly improved the accuracy on those books that we're originally struggling with. And from a project management point of view, very briefly, we were uh, a team working remotely uh, in India and in the UK. Uh, we managed this workflow by using a Google Sheet, um, tracking uh, the status of each book through the Transcribus workflow, and this linked to a Power BI dashboard which updated in real time and gave us a very nice visual snapshot of our progress. And for example, we could see how many books had needed layout correction, and we were able to forecast how much longer the work would take us. So far, we have automated OCR for Bengali books on more than 100,000 pages, uh, with about another 50,000 to go. Uh, we're exporting these as page XML, and we're using a style sheet conversion into Alto XML version 2, which is the format required for ingest into the British Library's repository and to work with our IIIF image viewer. So that's the Bengali project, and now we're trying to do something similar with our Urdu printed books, which again, predominantly 19th century. Uh, first of all, well, we didn't have the available language resource to create the ground truth, so we tried uh, Heidelberg's open model for Urdu, uh, which we were only really able to give a kind of cursory uh, look over for the results, but Although they looked reasonably good, we realized we would need to produce more ground truth. So we've reached out to the crowd. We uh, posted a message on the Urdu listserv at Columbia University. And about eight or nine people responded saying they would be interested in volunteering to help create ground truth for the Urdu books. Um, so we're using Transcribus Lite to run this exercise. Uh, we have assigned one collection per volunteer for transcription so that each volunteer it's not tempted to work on someone else's material and correct it and potentially get into fights about that. Um, we, we do the baseline detection ourselves and then the volunteers simply transcribe and mark the pages as done when finished. Um, early feedback from the volunteers is that they are finding the Transcribus Lite interface extremely straightforward. There are no difficulties from a technical point of view. Any questions they have are normally around the uh, transcription conventions. Um, the majority of the work has been done by one person, so we're trying to give them as much as possible. Uh, they've created 44 pages, which um, it, we're nearly getting to the point where we would like to train our first model just to get a baseline understanding of our accuracy. And then we can forecast how much more ground truth we will need. Uh, and then there are just a few other initiatives I should mention at the British Library that we are currently working on or have been working on um, that might be of relevance to this audience. So one particular project is we're very excited about is called Converter Card, where we're working with digitized catalog cards um, for our Urdu and Chinese books, and we would like to convert these digital scans into online catalog records. So my colleague Georgia trained a P2 PALA model which proved uh, very accurate at recognizing shelf mark, title, and author. And um, Adi, who sat here, also trained a, a text model which worked um, extremely well. And so we would like to uh, use this to extract um, the, the, these aspects from the XML, um, the shelf mark, title, and author, and then use that to query OCLC WorldCat to retrieve the matching records and be able to populate our catalog records eventually with, with that kind of data. So that's something we're exploring at the moment. Um, Adi's also been involved over the years with a project that's working with Arabic scientific manuscripts. Um, so these are from the, they've been digitized through the Qatar Digital Library and they achieved a good character accuracy based on uh, just over 100 pages of ground truth training. And they're currently looking at options for 
um, creating more ground truth and the possibilities around that. And there are data sets available on the British Library's research repository from the created ground truth. Um, yeah, we see Transcribus at the British Library as a more and more an integral part of our service that we're offering for HDR and OCR. And we are increasingly integrating it into our post-digitization workflows. Uh, as transcribers can read manuscript and non-Latin scripts as well as um, be trained on bespoke structural recognition. It really does plug a gap that we currently have. We, we use Abbey as well um, for printed, but that doesn't support index scripts. So transcribers has proved invaluable in this aspect. And with that in mind, we're spreading the word to our colleagues in collection areas who would be interested in using their own material. We've run several training events where they're hands-on sessions that have proved very popular with our own colleagues and also when we've been running uh, events in work in India. And so to briefly conclude our talk, um, I think we're just running over slightly, but uh, it'll just be another minute. We think that Transcribus Lite, um, or I think, because I've been the one using that, is a pretty good option for crowdsourcing, especially if you're working with a small group of volunteers. I can't comment on how it is with a larger group. Um, P2 Pala has been kind of hit and miss for me, like extremely effective in some cases and uh, or otherwise uh, not. Uh, but it proved very useful so far for our digitized catalog cards. Uh, there are, uh, oh, Nicole wanted to mention as well about the appreciation that Transcribers can be trained on our own material and without the inbuilt dictionaries. Um, but there are unique challenges to non-Latin scripts, as our talk has hopefully shown today, with the form of the characters, the scripts, um, diacritics, ligatures, etc. Um, the fact that other OCR tools do not really support it often, or are not very good at reading index scripts. Um, material challenges, the variety of printed fonts, um, physical deterioration that we deal with with archival documents, this all plays a part. But uh, we hope that our projects are proving that these challenges can be overcome, and often with not too much training as well. A surprisingly little amount of ground truth training has yielded very good results. Um, so we would like to conclude by saying that we think Transcribus has been and will be a great solution for printed texts in South Asian languages. And that concludes our talk, so thank you. Well, thank you very much for these insights. Um, Nicola is joining us on stage again, so we're ready for your questions. Here we go. Microphone is coming. <laughs> Um, thanks for the presentation from both of you. This is more a question for Tom, so I apologize uh, for that. Um, but just off the back of the workshop yesterday about data sharing and acknowledging contributions from the crowd um, and members of the public, um, I just wondered whether the British Library has any thoughts about how you're crediting people who responded to the Columbia University call, especially if it's this one person who's transcribed 44 pages, um, especially given the kind of British context of libraries outsourcing work in the past, um, you know, using quite dubious means, which the National Library of Scotland was also culpable for. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, particularly as uh, the books that we're dealing with, well, uh, they found their way to the British Library through a form of effectively colonial legal deposit during British occupation of India. So this is a question <laughs> I quite often face. And I think it's extremely important to recognize the efforts of everybody who's contributing to this ground truth. And we will certainly do that. There are practical ways to do that, um, obviously through events, um, through blog posts, also on where we share our data sets through our research repository, there is an option to credit people there who have contributed. So I think that's, that's actually a very useful um, way of crediting them for research because that can prove to be uh, used in citation and so on. Um, and we also had to be quite clear up front that this was just expected to be um, a volunteer-led exercise. So we've undertaken other initiatives with Wikisource in India as well, where again, we had volunteers correcting OCR text 
there we were able to offer prizes um, in, in that certain scenario, but there were, there's always some kind of restriction, so the prizes could not be offered outside of India, and therefore mm -hmm. the people taking part had to take part, had to be based in India for that competition. But um, with the Urdu um, material, we're still thinking through ways and other ways in which we can, um, you know, fairly acknowledge the efforts of the people who are involved. But it's definitely important to do so. In, in the meantime, we have another question online. It goes in the same direction. Um, it's also for Tom. Is there a mode in which Urdu and Arabic text could be translated to within the tool so that text analysis could be done too? So textual, sorry, textual analysis. Whether Urdu and Arabic can be used for comparative analysis. I have no idea about Arabic. <laughs> well, based on the NASC script, I believe they could be, yeah. Could be. So I've, I've, I don't have more more context. So I think with um, the Urdu text that uh, being the digitized Urdu text is often in the Arabic Nasq script. So uh, that's all I can really say on that subject. And, yeah. Do you have anything to add? Maybe, maybe we got a follow up. But thank you. Okay. Hmm. We have some more questions. I do have a question that's actually for both of the speakers. I wanted to ask Nicole if, she, if you could speak just a little bit more about how you took the Alto XML and then made it uh, available um, via this uh, site. In, I think it was in Heidelberg you mentioned, the FID Forest Way. And I, the, the connection to the other project is I'm wondering what your thoughts are on when you create Urdu text, I know you're not there yet, but once you have that, then te that text created, what's going to be, what, what will happen as you begin to export that into XML and then try to put that onto readers? Because text directionality seems to make a, a difference. I can say something, yeah. something quite important I forgot to mention during my talk is that our books, although they are online and not yet searchable because we have produced the OCR for 100,000 pages in Alto, but we are not ready as an institution to ingest that into our new um, repository. Um, I'm not sure I mentioned that. So we haven't done anything with our Alto other than create it, and it's sitting there in networked folders waiting to be um, ingested. But it's obviously an important format in terms of um, recognizing the positioning of the words on the page for full text search eventually. We did try a P2 Pala tool on our title pages to see whether we could tag the publisher, title, date, etc. that would have then come through into the Alto, but um, that didn't work as a P2 Pala model. But uh, yeah, we, we required specifically, specifically to use um, version two of Alto with our systems currently. We can't use the latest versions at the moment. Um, I'm not sure if that answers your question from mine. That point? I cannot add much from my side because I export um, the Alto XML files from Transcribus and then hand them over to our IT PIP department and they do the rest. And mm -hmm. what they really do, I cannot explain. I'm sorry. Yeah, we um, just to add as well, we will make all of our Alto available as raw data sets mm -hmm. on our repository. Um, so it's quite important for us why I mentioned the baseline P2Pala model that we created is obviously to try and preserve the reading order. Um, eventually, we anticipate some researchers wanting to undertake natural language processing tasks and looking for contextual analysis in the text. So, um, like I suppose, regardless of the format we were producing, that would have been useful. But uh, we probably will export from Transcribus not only as Alto, but in other formats. And we've been looking at other libraries, like National Library of Scotland, um, etc., for the types of formats they make available through their data sets. And, that's useful to try to make sure that we're being consistent, I suppose, across the industry. Okay, we have one more question here at the front. Is that still? <laughs> yeah. Yes, I had a similar question about all the rest that you said, um, but maybe someone else knows it. I heard it yesterday as well that people uh, uh, export in, in, page, ex in uh, page and then uh, convert it to Alto, and I was wondering, is it always needed, and what are the benefits? 
Mm, I had to do it because Transcribus uh, only exports Alto version 4, and we needed version 2, so I had to convert either from Alto to Alto or uh, Page to Alto, so I just found um, a style sheet conversion to do that, but it's, it does add an extra step into the process once you've exported to, to do that. Um, I think I did ask the Transcribers team whether it would be possible to export earlier versions of Alto, but I don't think it is. Um, we would have asked. Uh, we would have to ask the developers in terms of these things. Always, yeah, it wasn't possible yeah. all the time. Mm. Right. One more question. Yeah. Thank you for your presentation. I was wondering regarding crowdsourcing transcriptions. Do you offer the, to the transcribers uh, strict directions on how to transcribe, or they do it freely and then you curate the results? Thank you. We offered some advice. Some some standard advice around the transcription conventions and also I found the guidance on the transcribers website quite useful which provides that kind of advice so that's what I was sending them. Um, the typical question that we're coming through is where there may be like a huge gap between on a sentence on a printed page and like how to treat that do they put several spaces between order to reduce the gap just one that's uh, as we're doing this, we're kind of building up these questions so that if we do it again, we have a, almost a cheat sheet to give to people. Okay. Then, if it's fine for everybody, I would end this presentation here um, as we're out of time. <laughs> and, of course, you also get the cups. <laughs> Sorry for holding you up. Here you go.